Good morning. Bonjour tout le monde. A good afternoon to those of you in Eastern Canada. Good morning to those in the West and good day to those watching from around the world. Uh, bienvenue aujourd'hui. Uh, moi, je suis le président et chef de la direction de, de la Fondation Asie-Pacifique du Canada. I'm the president and CEO of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada, Jeff Dankaval. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to APF Canada's 2021 National Opinion Poll on Canada's generational perspectives on Asia. Uh, first, I'd like to take a moment to note that the places that Canadians call home are the traditional territories of many First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. APF Canada's own headquarters, where I speak to you from today, is on the traditional ancestral and unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh people. We're grateful to Canada's Indigenous peoples for their stewardship, and we are collectively committed to the process of reconciliation. Now, as some of you may know, APF Canada has been taking the pulse on Canadian public opinion about Asia since 2004. We have a long running series on trend analysis and perspectives on issues including Canada's Asia Pacific identity, the economics importance and future growth of Asia, Canadians awareness and understanding of the region and public support for trade agreements and policies that foster Canada Asia relations. Every other year we take a thematic approach and this year's focus is on the generational divide in knowledge, understanding and awareness about Asia. We're looking at the increasing diversity in Canada's younger population. And this poll explores the generational differences in the experience of multiculturalism in Canada and how diversity translates into differences in opinions and feelings toward Asia, Asians and Canadians of Asian descent. We strongly believe that identifying gaps in understanding is the first step in combating anti-Asian racism. It's also the key to better preparing Canadians for a changing socioeconomic structure of the global economy. Uh, before we begin a few housekeeping notes, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website uh, after uh, today's event. Uh, we are hosting in, in English, mais les questions et les commentaires en français sont très, très, très bienvenus. We welcome questions in both English and French through the Q&A box. And if you have any issues about technical support, please contact Mandy at the following email address, events at asiapacific.ca. And with that, it's my great pleasure and privilege, and for me for the first time in, in 2021, having started myself in the job in just in September, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our esteemed uh, colleague, um, Jeff Reeves, the VP Research and Strategy of the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. Uh, Jeff, je passe la parole à vous. Thank you and good morning and good afternoon to everybody. I'll just echo Jeff Nankerville's comments about the importance of this report and the value of APF Canada's national opinion polls in general. Now, while the survey and polling landscape has become more crowded today than when APF Canada first started its national opinion polling in 2004, we believe that the high quality of our reports, including methodology, sample size, and scope, continue to differentiate our polling in terms of value added. Now, rather than offer a snapshot of where public opinion is on a specific moment at a specific time, perceptions that are subject to rapid change, we're really more interested in capturing broader trends around Canadian perceptions towards Asia that can inform public policy and long-term strategic planning. Now, in this respect, our poll today highlights are highlighting the generational differences between Canadians when thinking about Asia couldn't be more relevant. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to the poll's principal author, Dr. Shiroshi Day, our program manager for our Perspectives Asia Pillar. So Shiroshi, over to you. Thank you for the introduction, Jeff. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you so much for coming here for our 2021 NOP launch event. As Jeff mentioned in his welcome remarks, against the backdrop of Asia Pacific's growing role in the global market and Canada's growing diversification, 
it is pertinent to gauge Canadian perspectives and awareness of Asia, especially among young adults. This helps us to ensure that Canada is keeping pace with the changing global dynamics now and into the future. But before we go into the survey results, I would just like to talk a bit about our methods. Now, we worked with Canadian polling firm Leger to survey 2,592 Canadians in the second and third week of September this year. This robust sample size is representative of the Canadian population, and the data has been weighted by province, age, and gender to ensure its representativeness. Now, as I move on, I will be talking about the average Canadian opinion, but in addition to that, I will also be talking about how the generations differ from each other. Now, these are the four generations that we have identified throughout the report. Broadly speaking, we find distinct differences in many cases, particularly between the younger generations under 34, whom we identify as Gen Z and millennials, and on the other side, the baby boomers, whom we identify as 55 years or above. Now, it was also interesting to note that 15% of Canadians in this survey self-identified as Canadians of Asian descent. Now, when we break it down by generations, it gets even more interesting. We find that the younger generations self-identify more as Canadians of Asian descent than what we see in case of baby boomers. Now, according to the last Canadian census data as well, 21.5% of Canadians aged 15 to 24 and 21.2% of Canadians aged 25 to 34 identified as Canadians of Asian descent. While we don't go into the differences in opinion between Canadians of Asian descent and non-Asian descent in this presentation, we do highlight interesting differences throughout the report. So I would definitely encourage you to take a look at that. Now, in this first section, I will provide an overview of Canadians' position on Asia. Do they perceive Asia to have any impact on Canada? How important is building an understanding or competency of Asia for Canada's future? Let's take a look at what Canadians have to say. When asked about impacts of Asia, we observe an interesting result. First, we find that Canadians think that Asia will largely have a positive impact on Canada in the next few decades. Specifically, let's take a closer look at this data here. A majority of respondents from all age groups think that technology and innovation from Asia, immigration from Asia, influence of Asian cultures and traditions on Asia, and Asia's economic growth will have a positive impact on Canada in the next decades. These are the first four categories here. Now, our polling data also suggests that the baby boomers, if you observe the purple bars in each of these groupings, are significantly more negative in their perceptions compared to the younger generations for almost all factors. Now, in line with those results about the impact of Asia on Canada, we also found that Canadians think it is important for Canada's future economic growth and social diversity to build Asia competency in several areas. Compared to those who think it is not at all important, which is on the left of the graphic here, compared to those who think it is not at all important, what we find is that respondents who think it is very important or important are much more, especially when it comes to building competency and understanding about Asian society, culture, and protocols. These are the first three categories. This remains true regardless of which generation respondents are from. Now, let me bring your attention to the last category, Asian languages. We observe on average, 71% find it at least somewhat important to build competency in Asian languages. Among them, 24% find it very important or important. In particular, the younger generations find it more important than baby boomers. As we will see later in this presentation, the younger generation stand out in terms of their interest and conversational fluency in Asian languages. 
But before we move on to languages, let's first understand whether Canadians are at all interested in learning more about Asia. Furthermore, how much do they know about Asia? A majority of Canadians say that they are very to somewhat interested in learning about Asia. But what we observe is that there are also generational differences, as you can see in this graph, where 47% of baby boomers express some interest about learning about Asia, 58% or more from the younger generations show interest in learning about Asia. Now, when asked about the perceived knowledge of Asia, what we find is that Canadians believe they have fairly limited knowledge about Asia. At most, about a quarter of respondents said they have a fair amount of knowledge or more about China and Japan. Let's zoom in here a little so that you can get a better look. For China, Japan, and India, again, we find that about half said that they have only a little bit of knowledge. Interestingly, when it comes to generations, there are interesting differences there as well. As we see, Gen Z respondents reported a fair amount or a lot of knowledge, slightly more for countries like China, Japan, India, and the Philippines compared to all the other generations where their re reported knowledge is quite similar for these economies. Now, when we compare their perceived knowledge to their actual awareness of Asia, as we do in this case, we ask them questions about Asian geography, which is the, le uh, the left graphic, and current events, which is the right graphic, we find the baby boomers to show better awareness than the younger generations. Now, if you look closely, in the first figure, we see that 70% of respondents were able to identify Japan on a map of Asia, and nearly 50% identify Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia correctly. Overall, we found that baby boomers had the most success identifying Asian countries on a map. Now let's take a look at current events and general knowledge question. In the second figure, we find that baby boomers, if you follow the purple bars here, had more success associating current events like farmers' protests to India and general knowledge questions like Taipei is the capital city of Taiwan. However, the only question where they did kind of fall behind was a popular culture question, which was about uh, Oscar winning filmmaker Chloe Zhao's origins. But perhaps there is an interesting data there. Let's come back to it in a bit. Now, following an assessment of Canadians' perceived knowledge and awareness, we move on to the area of Canadians' perception of how best to build awareness about Asia. So one of the first things that we ask Canadians is, what are the sources of information? What are the sources of knowledge about and exposure to Asian history, culture, people, politics, and current affairs that they find important? And we found that the mainstream news outlets, traditional and online, are the top sources of information for Canadians, followed by conversations with personal networks, popular culture, and newsfeed or social media. But there are significant generational divides. Gen Z and millennials are more likely to get information from popular culture about or from Asia and their social circles, with social media close behind as a third most popular option. By contrast, a majority of baby boomers identify traditional mainstream news outlets as their top source of information about Asia. Now, one striking result is that only 18% of Canadians mention education or professional development as one of the channels through which they have acquired some knowledge and exposure to Asia. Gen Z are more likely than other generations to consider education as an important source. But part of the reason why more Canadians don't choose education as a top source may be evident from this particular data point, their opinion about high school education as shown in this graphic. A majority, that is 76% of them, said that they had too little to no exposure to Asia in their high school education. In fact, Canadians of all ages overwhelmingly believed that they had too little or no exposure at all to Asia during their high school education. 
Now, before we go any further, let's ask you a question that we used in our polls. You will see a poll pop up on your screen at this point of time. The question is, what are the key challenges you face when looking for more information about Asian countries or Asian people? Please select all that apply. Some of the options that you can see is credibility of information, language barrier, access to information, availability of information, lack of opportunities, lack of interest or motivation, lack of personal connection. Other, no challenges, or probably you don't look for more information about Asia or Asians. We'll close the poll in a couple of seconds here, and we can take a look at how your responses compare to the rest of Canadians. Okay, so perhaps we can close the poll now. Okay, so as we can see right now, the top option over here is credibility of information. 50% of you say credibility of information is the top challenge. 43% uh, mention language barrier, 36% mention availability of information. And very few, of course, 1% say I don't look for more information and 14% say no challenges. Let's see what Canadians have to say about their key challenges. If you look closely at this particular graphic, then you can see that one of the top challenges mentioned by Canadians is language barriers. And this is pretty consistent as the top key challenge across generations. When searching for more information about Asia or Asians, in fact, we find almost half of Gen Z and millennial cite language barriers as a key challenge. Meanwhile, three out of 10 baby boomers say that they don't seek additional information about Asia or Asians compared to 12% of Gen Z and millennials. Now that we have reviewed sources of information and challenges to accessing information, how best do we build awareness about Asia? What we did was we asked Canadians who expressed an interest in learning more about Asia about the most effective ways to build awareness. We asked them to select their top three. And what we find is two methods really stand out. Engage in more community events celebrating Asian cultures. 47% of all Canadians chose that. And 46% chose increased emphasis on teaching about Asia and the education system. This kind of follows from that point where we also find that majority of Canadians found that they had very little exposure to Asia in their high school education. Only 18% chose education as a source of information. So it kind of follows from that, that many people also feel that there should be an increased emphasis on teaching about Asia and the education system. Now, consistent with the average opinion, Gen Z, which is the light blue colored bar here, also recommend increasing community engagement and an emphasis on teaching about Asia in schools. But they also highlight having Asian languages as an optional foreign language at school and the need to increase access to student exchange programs as effective methods to build awareness about Asia and Asians. Now in this section, we expand upon Asian languages and Canadian perceptions. As discussed earlier, 57% of Canadians said that they were very to somewhat interested in learning about Asia. Now, majority are interested in learning about Asian cuisine, history, and in traveling to Asia. But there are interesting generational differences when we look closely at this data. The blue and red lines of, to the left of the graph shows that the younger generations have more interest or engagement in Asian languages and culture that is the first three categories compared to the older generations. 
Meanwhile, we find that baby boomers, which is the purple bars to the right end of the graph, are more interested or engaged in Asian politics, history, and geography compared to the younger generations. So the younger generation's interest in language is something which is really interesting. So let's move on to the next data point here. You know, following from that interest in language, what we also find is that if given a choice, aside from English and French, most Canadians mention that they would like to learn Spanish. But it was also interesting to see that 12% mentioned Chinese languages and around 6% mentioned Japanese. Now, baby boomers consistently show lower interest in learning Asian languages compared to other generations. We find that only 16% of baby boomers mention an Asian language as their language choice if given a free course which is significantly lower than Gen X, 24%, Millennials at 26%, and Gen Z at 33%. Now in our 2021 NOP, we also find that 13% of Canadians say that they can speak at least one Asian language fluently. In total, respondents with conversational fluency mentioned 21 different Asian languages, with some respondents mentioning, indicating that they know multiple languages. Now, Gen Z and Millennials, we find, are more likely to have conversational fluency in an Asian language compared to older generations here. Finally, in the last section of this presentation, we conclude with Canadian perspectives about Asia, their feelings and perception of future areas of collaboration. Now we know that Canadians' mental image of Asia is often dominated by China. So one of the first questions we asked is, when you think of Asia, what is the first country that comes to your mind? Undoubtedly, China still dominates their thoughts. 64% of Canadians mention China. But here is an interesting difference. Back in 2017, when we asked the same question, 69% had mentioned China. So the proportion of people who are mentioning China has gone down. And compared to 2017, we also find that slightly more Canadian respondents mention India and Japan. Now, this is suggesting that Canadians' perception of Asia may be broadening. But what about their feelings towards each of these economies? Let's take a look at that. We adapted one of our legacy questions for this purpose, and we asked Canadians about their feelings for various economies. What is interesting here is that on a scale of 1 to 10, Canadians continue to show pretty warm feelings towards Japan and the coldest feelings toward China. However, what is interesting to note here is that Canadians' feelings towards China has actually come up from a decade low in 2020 of 3.6 to 4.5 in 2021. We should note at this point that the poll was conducted before the resolution of the Meng Wanzhou and the two Michaels case in September 2021. Now, as we look at this graph, I would also like to point out that one of the most interesting generational divides shows in this poll shows up in this particular data point about feelings toward Asia. Millennials hold the warmest feelings toward Asia of all generations for all economies. That is the red bar in each of these groupings. And baby boomers, on the other hand, hold the coldest feelings towards Asia for, for all economies. That is the purple bar in each of these groupings. Finally, where do we go from this juncture? As Canadians suggest, there are quite a few areas for collaboration with Asia that are strategically important for Canada. A majority indicate the need to collaborate on issues of pollution and environmental degradation among the top five areas. 48% also mention sustainable energy development, 45% mention improving women's and children's rights, 
all key areas in Canada's inclusive foreign policy goals and development work. Now, finally, in conclusion, I would like to say that first, we find there is an increasing need to focus our attention on building Canadians' awareness and competency about Asia to ensure Canada is prepared for its domestic growth and development and also remains competitive in the global market that is doubling down on engaging with the larger Asia Pacific region. Canada's younger generation's interest in learning about Asia, particularly Asian languages and culture, is also remarkable. Compared to older generations, they are also more fluent in Asian languages and have a more positive perspective about Asia's impact on Canada's future. And I should note here that this interest among Canadian youth holds irrespective of their ethnic ethnicity. Whether they're Canadians of Asian descent or not, they do show a whole amount of interest to learn more about Asia. Perhaps this is showing the ripple effects of a more diverse Canadian youth. Now, among the most effective methods, apart from community engagement, education emerges as an important factor and key to building awareness and competency about Asia. And finally, we see Canadians share warm feelings toward Asia, particularly the millennials, which is a significant step forward towards engaging with the region. Canadians across all generations agree on the importance of Canada-Asia collaboration and perceive a positive impact of Asia on Canada's near future. With that, I bring my presentation to a close and will be open to further questions and discussions. Shiroshi, thank you so much for such a wonderful presentation. Um, it's packed full of data, and I know that uh, we we can dive a lot deeper into some of these issue areas in, in terms of uh, getting a little bit more into some of the granularity around the findings that we had with the poll. And we certainly open the floor to participants to contribute questions through the chat function. But I'd like to, to kick off the discussion a little bit by but some things in particular that I saw kind of as, as counterintuitive in some of the data that, um, that you walked through. And I wonder if you have any opinions about them in, in particular, uh, pointing to the, the work on generational differences on strategically important areas for Canada, Asia collaboration. Now I was kind of struck by looking at in, in terms of the different priorities that we can identify across Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, and, and Baby Boomers in particular, it seems that the, the Baby Boomers are, are more interested in opportunity for collaboration on issues of environmental degradation and pollution at, at 66%, sustainable energy and development, improving rights of women and children, developing food security and, and safety systems, even on, on public health. Uh, you see a lot more interest, I think, from the boomers than you do from Gen Z and, and the millennials, if I'm reading if I'm reading the chart right. Yeah. But we talk about the, the fundamental thesis of the report being that the, the millennials in, in general have a warmer sense of, of feeling towards the Asia Pacific. Yet there seems to be a little bit of a disconnect to understanding where the opportunities are, right? When we talk about environmental issues and environmental degradation, we typically talk about this in terms of generations as well, where there's a much more of a movement among younger generations to address environmental issues. But here it seems that that's the exact opposite of what we're seeing. It's the boomers that are looking for opportunities to engage in Asia. And so I wonder if you have any insight into where, how that data came from. Uh, why, why is it that the boomers see, uh, or that the boomer generation 55 plus, see that opportunity in Asia and the millennials don't to the same degree? Yet the millennials have uh, warmer perceptions of the Asia Pacific region. I think that's that's a great question, Jeff. And you know, I would love to speculate as to why people think the way they think, but of course, the polls don't help us to do that. But what what I can say from this particular data set and this particular survey that despite warmer feelings toward Asia, we also realize that there is a lack of awareness or exposure as well. Because when we look at, you know, when we look at the questions about, say, perceived knowledge versus actual awareness, and when we measure it for the different generations, what we see is that 
the younger generations do perceive that they have more knowledge, mm. they have more awareness. But when it comes to actual awareness, and we just measured for Asian geography and uh, current events, which is not an absolute measure, we definitely need to be able to do more around that. But when we look at that, we see that the baby boomers actually have more awareness. So I would say probably that is one of the reasons which really plays into these areas of collaboration and how baby boomers tend to see the importance of uh, you know, Canada-Asia collaborations as opposed to the Gen Z. But related to this particular point, we are talking about Canada-Asia collaboration. So I would also bring up another data point, which is talking about the impacts of Asia on Canada, where we see that Gen Z or the younger generations have perceive more positive impact compared to the older generations. So there is that as well. So it's it's an interesting mix of data over here. And I, I don't think I have an explanation for why, but it's definitely something that which we can prod further to understand what is driving this interest and awareness and what are some of the other ways of exposing Canadians to you know Asia and build their competency about different areas of collaboration. That's interesting. I think you you kind of maybe have answered a portion of maybe my second question, but the other area that I thought was a bit counterintuitive was on generational differences about the effective methods uh, to build awareness. In particular, the focus on the, the baby boomer 50 plus, 55 plus on increased emphasis on teaching about Asia in the education system. 55% uh, of boomers said that that was uh, an appropriate way of increasing knowledge, but only 44% of Gen Z and 44% of the millennials identified the need to have more Asian curricula in, in their education, that obviously coming out of secondary school or tertiary you know, education. Do you think that's because they recognize that there's already enough in the, the education system or where do you think that disparity comes from? If you could talk a little bit to, to that. I wouldn't say that they find that there is already enough because when we go and look at the data point as to when we ask the question that do you feel you have enough exposure to Asia in your high school education across generations, it was an overwhelming that little to no exposure. So that opinion still stands. However, what I feel is for the younger generations, I think they're also looking to what else could be added because mm. education system changes also takes time. So what else can we add? And that is where we see that they opt for uh, options methods like having more optional foreign languages and which we also see language becomes like a significant factor for the younger generations because they're more interested in Asian languages. They have more language fluency. 33% of uh, Gen Z mentioned different Asian languages, way more compared to baby boomers, where we see 16%, way more than any other generation, in fact. And what we see is that they also emphasize on having more emphasis on exchange programs. So these are more applied activities where they can get hands-on experiences to learn more about Asia. And I think that is what we see is emerging more. Whereas for baby boomers, I would say that probably because they have already crossed that particular point in life, they would perceive that if we can have more emphasis of, uh, you know, emphasis on Asia and our education system, that would be one of the key methods. And that method stands irrespective of generations. We see that for all generations, it, it is one of the key methods, more for baby boomers, but it is one of the key methods emphasized by almost all generations. Now, Maybe following on to that, you mentioned in one of your first slides that the 29% of Gen Z respondents in the survey identify as Canadian of Asian descent, and, and we talk about the younger generations having greater fluency in particular around Asian languages. Do you think this helps explain why younger Canadians hold warmer feelings toward Asia in general and have more interest about Asia? So that is an interesting question. Uh, you know, we did, we did find that Asian uh, twenty nine percent of Gen Z say that they have uh, they identify as Canadians of Asian descent compared to twenty one percent of millennials, seventeen percent of Gen X, so on, and it keeps going growing smaller to six percent for baby boomers. And we also find that they have more Asian language fluency. Overall, the younger generations do share warmer feelings, 
But it's interesting to note here that it's not Gen Z who has the warmest feelings. It is the millennials. Hmm. So this was an interesting point that we found that although you would expect that Gen Z identify more as Canadians of Asian descent, so they are more likely to say that they, they should have warmer feelings toward Asia, but that was not the case. What we see is that irrespective of their Asian heritage as well, when it comes to millennials, they hold their warm feelings. So it really doesn't matter whether they're Canadians of Asian descent or not. Now, when it comes to Gen Z versus millennials, we also broke it down by Canadians of Asian descent versus non Canadians of, uh, you know, Canadians of non Asian descent to better understand where is the difference and why is there a difference. So what we find is that despite a larger proportion of Canadians of Asian descent and Gen Z, they hold comparatively more negative feelings toward Asia than the millennials. Mm -hmm. But there are differences as well, particularly when we look at certain countries. You know, we found that among Canadians of non-Asian descent, Gen Z held slightly warmer feelings for Japan and similar feelings for Singapore. But for Canadians of Asian descent, it is millennials who hold considerably warmer feelings for Singapore and Japan, among other Asian economies. Now, that's, that is quite interesting. Again, when we look at the differences in feelings between these two generations within each of these two groupings of Asian and non-Asian descent, we also see that the difference within Canadians of Asian descent is larger between these two generations than it is for Canadians of non-Asian descent. So I'll, let me pull some uh, questions from the audience. Um, sure. The first is, is with re respect to some of the data around the desirability to learn uh, an Asian language. And the question asks, does the poll consider that baby boomers may be less enthusiastic about learning Asian languages because they recognize that at, at the moment they are in, in terms of their education in their lives, it would be more challenging at their age than it would be for younger people to pick up a second language, in particular an Asian language, many of which are are notoriously difficult to learn? Sure, I mean, um, that's an interesting question. And uh, what I would say is that when it comes to languages like the European languages, let's not take into account Asian languages. Let's think about the European languages. We definitely find that baby boomers have more of a preference for learning Spanish, particularly more than the other generations. But when it comes to European languages like Italian and German, we actually don't find much of a difference between the generations. Mm. So if it really comes to the point of learning new languages, I would argue that that's not the primary concern, that it is more difficult. It is more about the choice. So what we find is that the younger generations choose more of the Asian languages, whereas that is not the case with the baby boomers. Mm. That's interesting. Uh, let me uh, pull another question from the audience. Can you talk about where the poll participants are from? Uh, do we have any data on their nationalities uh, as well as their place of residence within Canada? A secondary part of that question is, was immigrant status included in the demographics of participants? And I would add a third part to that is, can you talk about any provincial differences that we highlighted uh, in the report in, with respect to highlights? Sure. So, okay, so to the first part of the question about the uh, sample, uh, most of the uh, sample are Canadian citizens. They are not, I mean, they might have been immigrants, but they are now Canadian citizens. And a uh, very, very small proportion of it, about 100 respondents out of the 20, uh, 2,592 respondents were, I, I believe, permanent residents. I don't have the exact number, but it's a very small proportion. And uh, we have a mix of Canadians uh, from across the provinces. What we do is we ensure to collect data, which is representative of the provinces. And uh, so essentially the respondents are coming from each and every part of Canada. They're coming from right from the uh, West Coast to East Coast to West Coast and North to South. So yeah, that's about the sample. And now to your second question about the provincial differences. And I would say that no, we do not note any of the provincial differences in this report. However, please keep a watch on our website. We will be publishing something very soon because we do find very exciting provincial differences 
between uh, you know uh, Canadians uh, from different provinces. So I'll just share a bit of uh, the data on that. Great. Let me just pull up a quick slide. Okay. So as you can see here, we are looking at uh, Canadians of Asian descent by provinces. Now, 28% of British Columbians identify as Canadians of Asian descent, followed by 18% of Albertans and 18% of Ontarians. Lowest proportion from, uh, comes from Atlantic provinces and Quebec. What is also interesting is when we look by generations within each provinces, you would see that majority of Gen Z and BC and Northern provinces identify as Canadians of Asian descent. We also see that respondents from BC and North self-report the most knowledge for all Asian economies. Alberta is the third. We also find two thirds of the respondents from British Columbia, North, Alberta are at least somewhat interested about Asia compared to under half of respondents in Quebec and Saskatchewan. So what we plan to do is that we hope to publish something very soon about all of this data around provincial differences, but this is not a part of the main report. So I another thing that I, I found kind of striking in, in the poll was at the beginning when we showed the majority of, of negative um, perceptions towards Asian states, India was up there with China. And that was really surprising for me with respect to that perception that we're, we're getting about India in, in largely negative terms and it's essentially second to, to China. Because a lot of the discourse that we have here in, in Canada around India is the, the democratic alternative model, the important strategic balancer against China, uh, very, very kind of positive messages around. And I think it was also interesting to see that there was a relative uh, lack of knowledge around Modi as a, an uh, Indian leader uh, among mm -hmm. the population that was polled. So I wonder if you you have any perceptions or any insight into where that negativity comes from with respect uh, to, to India, particularly when we see uh, self, self kind of identification of a lack of knowledge around the political system, which I mean, in, in most instances, that would that would be the explanation, right? Some of the developments within India's national experience that could be you know, raised for criticism. But if, if people aren't aware that that's happening, where does the negativity come for, for India in particular? That's, that's such an interesting question. So there are two parts to this question. We didn't present about the world leaders, but that is in the main report. And what's interesting here is, yes, we do see that India really doesn't rank very high in terms of uh, its perceptions. I wouldn't say it's negative because on an average, it's pretty close to near neutral. And we find that feelings towards India has remained consistent over the years. However, it is interesting that it is pretty close to China. It is, it is the second last country here, right? And uh, I would say that, yes, current events might have an impact for Canadians' perceptions, but at the same time, the fact that it hasn't changed a whole lot in terms of the past year's events, maybe the farmers' protests, maybe other issues that have happened in India, also signifies that people may not really be aware of what's happening in India. So it's more about that lack of awareness and coupled with this point that, um, you know, India is the picture of India as a democratic country, a culturally diverse country, which plays out into how Canadians feel about India. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to the world leaders, it is interesting also to note that despite the fact that Canadians show the warmest feelings toward Japan, it is Japan's prime minister that they know the least about yeah. and among Asian leaders. They didn't know the leader. So essentially, this also points to the fact that it is possible that the leadership has a different effect on how people think about a country as opposed to the country itself. So perhaps those are two factors which should be treated separately. Because when it comes to India and Japan, we find that people express that they don't really know about these leaders. But what's interesting is, although most Canadians express a lot of confidence in New Zealand Prime Minister, Jacinda Ardern, many of them don't know about Jacinda as well. In fact, more respondents 
don't know about Jacinda Ardern as much as they know about President Xi Jinping from China. Hmm. So that factor really has to be considered when we think about the global leaders as to how much do they actually know about them. And second, when it comes to their perception about these world leaders, what is their perception about these world leaders? And yes, even there we find that Narendra Modi kind of stands out. So what we see is that India is kind of treated separately from the leadership at this point. However, will it change? It is quite possible that perception will change with time and with awareness. On this slide, the feelings about Asia, uh, I'll take another question from our participants. Is there any reason why we don't see South Korea represented in, in this polling right here? Is, was, was it not identified as a, uh, a primary economy that the Canadians have warm feelings toward, or was there just not enough sample? Is there any reason that we don't see South Korea more prominently uh, in some of these, these pollings? Sure, okay. that's a good question. So. One of the constraints when you do conduct a survey is how many countries you can put into that particular question, right? So we wanted a good mix of major Asian economies, but also we wanted to get an understanding of how Canadians feel about smaller economies like the Philippines and Indonesia. So it was it was more of a matter of interest of uh, space. As I mentioned, this is a legacy question. So we track Canadians' feelings towards South Korea every um, odd year no even year so next year we will be tracking how canadians feel about south korea but for this year's purposes we wanted to have a good mix of say japan singapore philippines um indonesia countries that we have not really asked about in the past mm -hmm. as to how much canadians are aware of these countries and what do they feel about these countries because even when we look at our own demographic we what we realize is the three most prominent Asian diaspora are actually from China, India, and then the Philippines. Mm. However, are Canadians really aware of the Philippines? So this is a this is a way to be able to measure that. So a couple questions that I'm going to try to link together in a, in a big question. Um, the first is, can you speak to the operational definition of Asians in your survey? Uh, what was the working definition that we used to define this term, uh, Asians? And then in terms of the differences between Canadians that identify as Canadians of Asian um, descent and those with non-Asian descent, are there any broad trends or interesting findings that you can share between these different demographic groups? Sure. So when it comes to Asians, um, like specifically when it comes to these questions, we are using the operational definition of Asia and Asians as people who are west of Pakistan. No, sorry, um, from Pakistan towards the east. So basically all the countries towards east of Pakistan would be Asia for us in terms of our operational definition. However, when it comes to a survey, and that is why it's, it's important to note here that the question simply asks that do they identify as Canadians of Asian descent? So it is, of course, up to the uh, survey respondents perception of whether they identify as a person of Asian descent. Does that mean that the survey could have th that particular number of 15% uh, who identify as Canadians of Asian descent could include people from west of Pakistan? It is quite possible. However, we are not speculating about that. And when it comes to Canadians of Asian descent versus Canadians of non-Asian descent, there are actually very interesting differences. Particularly, broadly speaking, what I would say is that Canadians of Asian descent generally show more interest, more awareness about the culture, about the protocols, about languages, uh, about Asia. We also find that there are interesting differences, say for instance, when it comes to effective methods for building more awareness about Asia. We see Canadians of Asian descent lay more emphasis on building on having more community events than Canadians of non Asian descent. But interestingly, compared to Canadians of non Asian descent, they don't really emphasize a whole lot on placing more emphasis on teaching about Asia in a Canadian education system, so which was an interesting difference. 
We uh-huh. also have interesting difference by feelings, which I already explained when I was talking about Gen Z and millennials. Hmm. So following up on that question, another from our participants, based on the results, do you find that millennials see engagement either economically or politically with Asia and the West differently? So from Asia and the West, how do we define West here as the US as North America? I'd say maybe like a, a transatlantic understanding of engagement. Is there is there a fundamental difference in terms of paradigm when we see people talk about the di- desirability of engaging with with Asia or the Asia Pacific versus transatlantic? Is I mean, this poll really was looking more at, at perceptions of Asia? But if we had to to kind of extrapolate, do we do we see a different lens from the millennials when when they look at the op- the opportunities in Asia versus opportunities in in transatlantic affairs, and maybe getting back to the discussions about um, the first question I asked, which is: Is there more opportunity for engagement on environmental pollution or degradation opportunities? Uh, um, you know, renewable energy. Perhaps millennials see that there, those opportunities more in transatlantic type affairs or North American affairs, but not so much in Asia. Those differences. Did we see anything that we can point to? in terms of that that split in paradigm between different regional opportunities and engagement? I don't think this this particular survey can answer that because as, as you mentioned that this in this one, we were particularly looking towards engaging with Asia. We do have some questions where we do ask Canadians about their, for instance, in this feelings question, we ask Canadians also about their feelings toward Australia and United States, and uh, we do find that there are differences. However, when it comes to areas of engagement, um, I really cannot say to that because the data doesn't speak to that. But I would say that back in 2020, when we conducted the legacy NOP, we did see that most Canadians actually want to be able to diversify away from the US. Hmm. So it doesn't mean that, of course, the entire, uh, you know, other countries like Australia, uh, there is UK who are also like minded. There was also Japan, South Korea. When it comes to these countries, Canadians are more interested in having more engagement with other like minded economies. So there is a push to move away from the US that we see back in 2020. And I would assume that that feeling still holds. Does it hold more for millennials or not? I cannot speak to that, but I would assume that there is more of an interest towards building more engagement with Asia because millennials are also more diverse in terms of their uh, demographic makeup. So probably they have more exposure, more understanding about what's happening, particularly in terms of uh, education or maybe in terms of the professional experience. So that kind of pushes them towards that feeling that Asia may be where the opportunities are. So we we have a couple more questions. Um, And this one is specific to Japan. It asks, so Japan is a big investor in key sectors in Canada, and it is seen as a good corporate citizen. Do you think this would impact its perception? And I guess I would add to that. Can we identify any of the the contributors to these underlying perceptions across the different economies that we look at, right? Why do people hold this opinion about China versus India versus Japan? Uh, I mean, maybe that there's a bit of speculation that you have to do on this, because I don't know that we got into that level of granularity for this poll. Certainly, I think it'd be a, a challenge. But I mean, do you get a sense of where these positive versus negative sentiments are coming for these different economies? Uh, and and what, what could be those contributing factors? And again, maybe this is also some issues that we've pulled on in the past that you could, you could draw into, but not here. That's, that's actually a very interesting question. It makes me think like it would be a fantastic polling question in the coming polls probably. But no, we cannot specifically speak to as to why people think the way they think about particular economies, because we did not pull for that. And it is also a very, very exploratory question, because it would depend on what are your sources of information. So that is why I pulled up this slide, because when we look at sources of information, what was really striking for us is when we look at the younger generations, 
we see that popular culture is really an important source for them to learn more about Asia or Asians. So it is possible that they are more exposed towards popular culture, which means they're watching more movies, they're watching more documentaries, they're engaging in music, culture, K-pop is so popular right now. So I would say these are really having an impact on how they perceive Asia. Meanwhile, we see that baby boomers, they're still more dependent on traditional mainstream news outlets. So Canadian media altogether does have a huge role to play mm -hmm. in terms of how people perceive Asia. So it is important to put a lens, put a focus on what are Canadian media portrayals of Asia in our news, in our other formats as well, maybe entertainment programs, maybe popular culture. So I would say it is difficult to say as to why people think the way they think about different economies, but perhaps that's something which we can focus on further and understand what are some of the different sources of information about these different economies, particularly in the case of Japan or India, where, which are some of the more recognized economies as well, as we saw from you know that particular question where we asked Canadians, what is the first country that comes to your mind when, we, when you think about Asia? The top three countries were China, Japan, and India. Right. So it, it would be very interesting to see where exactly Canadians are learning about from what are the sources for these three countries. But I would I would I would also say that it, it may not be very different from this, what we see in this case. Um, but yes, there might be also differences. So it would be interesting. It's an exploratory question. So you know, I, I know the foundation is also doing some work looking at the type of media and media sentiment towards China in particular. How does the Canadian uh, media landscape cover issues around around China? Is it largely negative? Is it largely neutral? Is it largely positive? So that 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 thread of media and information being you know such a critical factor to how sentiment. Uh, uh, ultimately kind of coalesces around different states is very interesting. And it leads me kind of to our next question is, you mentioned that the feeling of Canadians towards China has recovered this year compared to last year. And this polling was actually done before uh, the Mo Joe to Michael's uh, mm -hmm. situation was, was resolved as it was. Uh, does that mean the feeling is back to the level it was before the pandemic? And, and could you speak to whether or not this trend is unique to China or is the feeling of Canadians towards other countries warmed up as well? Do we see this kind of correlation? That's a very interesting question. And uh, I, I cannot say whether their feelings would have gone down again, because again, that's that's it's, it's not possible for me to say that, but it's something that we could definitely look into perhaps next year when we ask Canadians again, that how do they feel about China under the current circumstances? But we did find interesting differences when it comes to the US as well. So even last year, when we pulled for feelings about US, it did hit a low of, I believe, somewhere around 4.5. Um, but even for feelings towards US, Canadians' feelings towards US has picked up. It's gone up to 6.1, which kind of signifies that Canadians' feelings towards US could be marked by the change in events, the change in presidency the change in politics and the uh, way US has been engaging with the world again. Um, it could be that for China, I cannot say as to what exactly precipitated to the point that they have warmer feelings than last year, but at the same time, the feelings can change. But when it comes to the other countries like uh, India, Japan, Hong Kong, which we have pulled in 2020 as well, their feelings have remained consistent. It has barely gone up or down by 0.1 or 2 points, which really is not much of a difference. So I would say that we don't see that same correlation where people are going up or down for any of the other economies, except for the US and China. Very interesting. Uh, getting back a little bit to the issue of education. Another question that we have from our participants is, you mentioned that the Canadians report a lack of exposure to Asia during their education. Now, were there any interesting differences that you could point to by province specific to this question? And I mean, we did, I think, already kind of highlight some of the differences. 
across provinces uh, and, and talk about this kind of sneak peek of a, a report to come. But can you make any further uh, comments on the, the provincial divide between this perception that there is a lack of, of exposure to Asia in the overall curricula? And then maybe a, even further to that, do we know about the differences between primary and secondary school uh, and adding to that in, in terms of provinces? Okay, so I'll ask answer your second question first, because no, we do not do it by primary and secondary education. We just asked about high school education. Mm -hmm. And to your first question about provincial differences, yes, there are interesting differences. In particular, what comes to mind is uh, that British Columbians, they were the least likely to say that they had none to very little exposure to Asia in their high school education compared to the other provinces. Whereas we find that Quebecers said that uh, were the most likely to say that they had very little to no exposure to Asia in their high school education. Similarly, when it comes to uh, you know emphasis on teaching about Asia over uh, you know over engagement and community events celebrating Asian Asian cultures, we find that respondents from Quebec and Atlantic provinces emphasize that more, that there should be more emphasis on teaching about Asia over community engagement, which is different from the other provinces where we see more community engagement to be the primary um, effective method chosen by respondents. So there are, there are definitely interesting differences when it comes to the point of education and probably also speaks to how the different education systems work in the different provinces and something to keep in mind as we proceed further. Great. Now, listen, we're coming up towards the end of our time here, and uh, I want to give you an opportunity to give your, your thoughts on some of the poll data that we got back and some of the findings that we got back, whether or not they actually made it to the final report, because uh, you know, I don't know if I'm certain that the participants don't know that much of the data that we collect is is not included in the report simply because we get so much and it, it's hard to to parse and, and package this in a way that that has a good narrative that crosses it. But is there anything that you saw during the process of this polling that was particularly interesting from your perspective, somebody that looks at Asia, that works on Asia and Canada Asia affairs uh, on a daily basis? Was there any highlight of this poll that we haven't touched on enough or, or that we you feel you could we could gain a little bit more value from from further exploring i i believe this is this is one of the most unique polls that we have probably conducted which actually looks more towards not just outward engagement but also inward like what can we do domestically to build more competency and understanding. And that is what makes this poll very, very unique. And yes, it is not possible to put every possible interesting finding that we have into one report. We wanted to keep it more about generational perspectives, but say for instance, you know, the differences between Canadians of Asian versus Canadians of non-Asian descent, it was so interesting. We wanted to be able to incorporate that. And we also find differences by provinces. So we kept the prov provincial differences for later to be published as a later report, but it is it is definitely something worth considering. Uh, to, you know, please keep a lookout for that particular report. And also, I would say that there is more work required in this space because we clearly have more questions around this space. Mm -hmm. We have only probably scratched the surface, scratched the surface for all the possible questions that could come our way about how best to build awareness, how, build, how best to build competitiveness of Canadians, particularly when we look at engaging with the Asia Pacific. This is just scratching the surface. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to understand more about what are some of the effective methods, what would work, what won't. Um, again, what would work for different countries? What works for Japan may not work for India. So these are very culturally, very different, social culturally, very different, politically, very different economies. And we need to have a better understanding and provide that understanding forward. Um, so I would say there is there is quite a bit, and there is also quite a bit we couldn't mention in the presentation, which we touched upon at various times. You know, like for instance, when it comes to languages, it's interesting to see that many many uh, respondents mentioned that they would be encouraged to learn an Asian language, 
if they were visiting an Asian country. Mm -hmm. However, when we ask about whether they have traveled to Asia, majority of them, majority of Canadians have never traveled to Asia. So it's, it's very interesting. But at the same time, if that opportunity does come up, they would want to travel to different countries. Specifically, I think we see a lot of respondents mention Japan. Mm. So there are relationships which can be built. There are people to people ties which can be built. It's just a matter of building those connections, awareness and uh, exposure for Canadians. It's interesting when we, we talk about all the opportunity that's in the Asia Pacific with respect to, to economics and the importance of understanding you know, the Indo-Pacific from a broader strategic lens, you know, central to that is understanding the opportunities and the challenges in terms of how they are, are presented at the regional level. And, and that does require language skills. It does require um, an understanding of the politics and the culture and the history of the region. And I think in order to be an effective actor within the Asia Pacific, you certainly need to raise that level of Asia competence across the country. So I think we've seen you know, opportunity areas where, where um, individuals are identifying that they do have good access to certain resources, whether it's in school, whether it's through popular culture, but there's a lot more that I think we can be doing at the provincial and national level to raise Asia competence. And, and in terms of the foundation, that's a priority for our work. It's something that we push forward. You're at the primary and secondary level schools here in BC and have worked very closely with the BC government on something we're, we're very proud of. But when you look at, at other economies across the Asia Pacific uh, that are really prioritizing engagement in either the Asia Pacific or Indo-Pacific and here use Australia as a, a great example, uh, this Asia literacy program that's been well funded by Canberra over the last decade. In many ways, I think Canada is, is far behind in terms of developing that, that capacity in, in primary and secondary school to raise awareness of what's happening around language, around culture, around education. So I think this, this, uh, this poll points to a, a good trend among the younger generations about wanting to move in that direction. And I think now what we need to do is, is work as a foundation and work with our partners across the country to provide resources and opportunities for, for them to achieve that, that learning opportunity. And I think this poll goes a really long way towards helping us think about what types of policies and what types of resources would be necessary to, to give them the skill sets that they need to engage in, in such a dynamic and such an important region as the Asia Pacific. But uh, I think that we have no more, we've exhausted our questions from the participants. Shiroshi, I'll give you a chance to say, uh, anything uh, in closing, although I think I, I just did that with respect to identifying anything additionally wanted to say, but any final words? Read the report. Read the report. And it's online as of today. Uh, for those that are interested in finding the report, we just made a link available through the chat function. Uh, it's my pleasure. It's been a pleasure to have this report, Shrosh. You've been on the hot seat for almost 45 minutes. You've done really, really well to get into this data. It's a fascinating report. I encourage everybody uh, that hasn't had a chance to download it, do go to our website. And while you're there, if you haven't signed up for Asia Watch, it's an easy click of a button and you get twice weekly newsletters that highlight the major trends in the Asia Pacific for Canada. Uh, thank you very much to the participants for getting on today and listening to our presentation. Thank you, Jeff, uh, for your opening remarks and setting up what has been such a wonderful discussion. And thank you, Shiroshi and Hugo Roy, who's also on the call and has also been a really, really important contributor to this report for putting this together. Our, our reports, our polls, as I said at the beginning, are unique in their sample size, in their depth, in their scope. They take a lot of work. Uh, really, really appreciate the, the work that's gone into this, Shiroshi. And we look forward to using the findings that we've we've collected here and put together in our poll to think about next steps for our own Asia Competence Program. But we also hope that those that got on today can see some of the value that the foundation can bring to discussions around Canada and Asia. Uh, do come and visit our website. We have a lot more information that's available there. So thank you very much and uh, good morning and good afternoon. Thank you.